Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hello. Coffee Class with Young Screenwriters. Uh, I'm Alexi, and this is Adam, and we are an online resource and community for up and coming screenwriters. Um, yes, I knew it. I was going to point to Adam when I said Adam, but then I decided hey. not to because I've never gotten it right in my life. So I decided that I would try right after. I you did once on uh, June 17th? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just, remember it down no, I'm to the... with you. I don't I don't even know if that was a Friday. <laughs> I'm just talking to you. <laughs> oh man. So June 17th of uh, 2020. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah. Right. yeah, 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 yeah. That sounds right. That sounds right. Watch it be a Friday Four, and actually be right. Three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Sorry. Those are different times when we showed up at 403 and at 404. Um <laughs> so we wanted to well, so first off, me and Adam met in person. For the first time ever, the third this last time. Week. For the third time. For the third time. <laughs> for the it's, first time it's ever, lore. this Young weekend. Lore. It is the lore. Allegedly, it was the third time, yeah. but that's the, neither the, here nor there. For those who don't know, I the first two times I met with Alexi, she didn't. She does not recall meeting me, and even though I went to her apartment for her husband's birthday party, whole thing. She has no, no memory of this happening. This was like in it 2017. Was there was like no alcohol involved. I was probably drinking like Coke no, no. I Zero. just my personality was I just, just so underwhelming. I like I remember sitting at the worthwhile. table and there being someone I didn't know at the head yeah. of it. Fair, but I can't but connect. To be fair, that, that was the Adam. that was the second time we met. Was it? Yes, I went to your apartment first. Really? For Carl's birthday. I think I was right. I actually remembered this whole time. Yeah, she's just fucking no. me. Anyway, let's talk about screenwriting. So I brought that up, though, because me and Adam met for the first oh, yes. third time on Sunday to see Dune. And then we saw it with Carl. And then as is inevitable, we ended up talking about it afterwards and breaking it, even though I don't know if we planned on that. But of course, it happened. And we started talking a lot because I've not read the books or seen the original ones, but Adam has. And so we both had different takes on it that kind of amounted to, is this a passive protagonist or is it an active protagonist within like an arc that lasts more than one movie? So the yes. first act of a bigger project. And so that As was a sort of... Point. We also yeah. want to just talk about that and like, well, yeah. What? Do, wh why do you want that? What is the effect that is achieved? Why? Um, why do people say never have a passive protagonist? Um, mm -hmm. Because you could say, objectively speaking, um, pa Paul Atreides in Dune Part One is extremely reactive. We're not going to spoil anything uh, for those who haven't seen it yet, but um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's an interesting it's an interesting debate in the sense of like this movie was act one of the book pretty much and has a really long act one and it's all set up for when Paul is actively pursuing an objective but this whole entire movie he's just reacting to bad things that are happening to him um, with exponential uh, stakes and in the context of the movie I do think it works um, as a movie, but it wouldn't work is if it didn't have part two coming. Like, yeah, knowing that there's more after, and you're only getting part of a story, um, it works. But if this was this was the full experience, I feel like people wouldn't be a, the people who like it would have liked it a lot less. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, assuming that it's it's designed in such a way where questions are answered and loose ends are resolved, just the fact that he isn't pursuing an objective other than like just status quo homeostasis. He's very much the archetypal uh, character in their normal world who is trying to cope. Now, I think this movie does have three distinct acts with a passive protagonist, like him before he goes to Arrakis, then going the to Arrakis. Arrakis. <laughs> right. Yeah. But um, I don't want to break down. I want to talk about passive protagonist versus active protagonist. And I think this is a thing that sneaks up on people, I think. 
Um, mm -hmm. It happens a lot with characters who are proxies for the writer, especially new writers who are writing characters that are close to them, that are like sort of representative of their voice and beliefs and maybe personality or type. Um, and what happens is basically they try to make characters likable. There's an effect of sort of like, oh, this poor character sympathize with them. All those bad things are happening to them. And you do want bad things to happen to your characters, but functionally to like really create like as engaging a plot as possible, um, you want your character to then, okay, well, what are they going to do about it? What do they strive for? Um, what are they thirsty for? Those are the qualities that tend to like become emotionally satisfying, especially, um, especially in a movie. Um, you know, you can only sort of have somebody reacting to bad things for so long before the character, before the audience loses like their point of empathy. You need to have at some point have a character go after something and drive the story rather than let the plot drive the characters. If that makes sense. It's kind of like a classic. You want the characters to drive the story. Um, so I, I feel I like I'm exactly. rambling a little bit. But is that no, close? No, you're, you're good. I think that some exa an example that helps me think about it a little bit and to get the difference is that a passive protagonist <laughs> that you hear defend so a, a blatantly passive protagonist is your character standing in the rain for the movie, right? There's all these things hitting them. There's all these objectives, and they're just there, right? The more common passive protagonist is somebody standing with an umbrella in the rain. And they're still just standing there, but they're holding an umbrella. And the writer points to the umbrella and is like, look, look, they're doing things. But the answer is they're only reacting. They're not striving towards anything. So the movie only becomes interesting when we're watching a person trying to get somewhere through a rainstorm, reacting to what's going on around them. So that helps me think about it a little bit. Because if you're wondering, is my protagonist active or not it's like do they just have an umbrella are they just protecting themselves from what they're doing or do they have that and they're going for something else um and that can be a way to visualize it for us visual people because it can get a little tricky because it's sometimes it's hard to say is that just an umbrella or is that actually them trying to get somewhere um and that comes back to objective which is when we're talking about active and passive protagonists, what we're really talking about is do they have an objective that they're driving towards the whole time? Right. Um, so active protagonist is something that only exists in relationship to an objective. And or John's trick for making sure that that objective is something that demands an active protagonist is making sure that the objective is something that is 100% needed, tangible, almost impossible to get, and what's the other one? It's those tangible, impossible to get, and 100% needed. Um, impossible for the protagonist. Yeah, yeah, impossible yeah. for the protagonist. And I think that there's a fourth one that was sort of like, oh, time, time that there's a set time that they have to get it in. So that's John's trick for helping people make active protagonists, because I think that that's one of the most common things that John has come up is this situation where people are writing about a protagonist just standing in the rain. And he's like, how do I ensure that we get them moving? It's like, okay, we'll get them something they have to, to reach tangibly within a certain amount of time um, and make it hard. So, and the yeah, more stakes that. you can put for the thing, the better, the more mm -hmm. interesting it is for the audience. Um, th there's some really good points up here. So I, I agree with Andilla here. I think the movie actually works because there's a situation like the family has a goal, which is to survive on. Well, they have a motivation for the goal. They have mm -hmm. to go to Arrakis and survive, um, which means they have to cultivate desert power, a relationship with the Fremen. You could say that that is resolved towards the end. Um, I won't say how it is. But uh, it's it's I, the issue I think is more sort of that objective isn't personal to the protagonist. Mm -hmm. 
he's along for the ride of this. But he, the family, like there, there is something that the Duke and everybody's moving towards. And I also think the situation is dramatic uh, and very interesting, which gives gives people a lot of um, gives a lot of grace, I think, for people to be more open to the story. So this is, I think, flows into. I mean, so a question is, for people like me who wouldn't necessarily know <coughs> that there's more coming, um, well, and like part wouldn't one. have, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, for me who wouldn't have an investment right. in it because of like the nostalgia or like because I know the story, I don't have any investment here. Why did I still sit through there and enjoy it and feel like we were driving towards something and like not want to get up to go get popcorn because I didn't want to miss something? You know, like, what's that about? And I think that this question that Holden has here fits into that. Yeah. Which is, so her question is, are a lot of horror movies protagonists passive? So this is one of those situations where horror movies can get away with a kind of React. Negative, yeah. negative objective. Um, but we tend to spin that to be positive. So when Avi has come on before, you all probably know Avi, he, right? He's written a lot of horror stuff. He talked to us about how in horror, sometimes the objective is just to not be killed by psycho man in the woods, right? So it's survive. Um, at some point in Dune, that becomes true. And I think that that's what keeps a lot of momentum. Um, yeah. So in a way, it's kind of structurally similar to that way of looking at a horror film. Um, Avi calls that like the negative objective, like don't die. We think it makes, we think it's a little bit clearer to look at the positive side of that. So instead of don't die, just say like survive, like get to the car or whatever it is that you're going towards tends to make it a little bit clearer. And that only works when the stakes are, are life and death, yeah. right? Like just to like, if you, if there's no immediate encroaching danger of, of dying, um, having a character pursue survival is not interesting. Um, the more difficult you make the survival, the more compelling, like the higher, more you raise the stakes, the more interesting that is as an objective. Although I will say, a lot of my favorite horror movies do have positive objectives. Um, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, Train to Busan. Objective, yes. get to Busan. <laughs> you know? And, or, or, or or it's, um, I'm thinking of uh, the host, right? It's like, save the girl, right? Like, I, I think that the horror, I think that there are a lot of horror films that do do the, oh, don't die really well, but I, I think it's usually more interesting when the characters have something they're trying to achieve um, to survive that's concrete and consistent because then you can build up stakes for something. Um, mm -hmm. And also I just want to say there's no rules, right? Like we're just trying to describe a phenomena and like why something works more often or is more interesting than other things. Like you can do whatever you want, um, but will it be interesting? Well, that's that's up to you, right? And the, we're just trying to present like a tool and under, way of understanding this. Um, mm -hmm. Like you could write a script or somebody just stays in the rain the whole time. Is that something that's going to interest people? You know? I think for Maybe, Hollywood films, probably not. For, 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 not just for Hollywood, but like, I think the modern popular like single film, there is a huge push towards going deep with a single point of view that changes, right? Like that is, if you go for like the most tried and true effective means of telling a story in a single film, it's a single protagonist with a single objective and a single flaw that they overcome. Mm -hmm. And the Dune, I think, works a little bit more in terms of focusing on the situation Mm -hmm. And like larger, more, it's a, it's, we're, we're a little, we're inside Paul and he's getting visions, but like, I think the second movie is probably going to be a little more engaging for people because, um, boy wants revenge, you know, that's a mm -hmm. way more, you know, it's not, not just any revenge, revenge against a specific person and reclaiming his father's, uh, re reclaiming control of the planet. Like that's a very specific goal. And I think the second movie is going to be 
a lot more interesting for a lot of people. I th or not just interesting. I think it's going to be a lot more personally engaging for people who aren't invested in the lore. Mm -hmm. So here's an interesting. This is an important point, which is that we have to care about the character before we care if they live or die, and that's something yeah. that I think that horror stuff has to do really fast, right? You like yes. because if the if your act two is going to be the horror part, which yeah. it is, then that means you have to make us care so fast in act one in order to just make act two as much just like packed in horror as possible. We have to care by that point. And that's always true, but that becomes even more highlighted in horror where it's specifically about like terrifying the audience through your protagonist. So for sure to open up that angle, we have to care. And that doesn't mean like, it just means care. Um, For sure. And just to bring up um, Juan's uh, comment about the Nausicaa, Valley of the Wind, um, that's honestly, I, when, if, you, if you compare that movie to the story of Dune, it's way more personally engaging. Like she, the protagonist, I forget her name, but like you you care about her and her community so much like you want them to be okay you know like there's so much personal investment in that story you know and i feel like a lot of people struggle to empathize with paul especially in the book i actually think as a book like he's just kind of he's he it's 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 a he's not like a human like he's like this psychic all-knowing person you know and it's less it's less flesh and blood, less for people to like people who aren't invested in like the more cerebral science fiction aspects. It's less for them. It's it's a, it's a less thirsty character, I should say. And I and I think as a general axiom, the thirstier you make your protagonist or the main point of view character, the more human beings tend to like be able to empathize with them. And I mean by thirsty, I mean like people who like need things and want things and go after them. You know, and do they were just actually thirsty. Yeah, so, uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. Actually, the, the yeah, and I think the the movie really captured the feeling of the book. If I was to be a total nitpicking jerk, and I'm a big fan of the book, so I I, I read them and they were meant a lot to me when I was younger. Um, but um, I think a, there's a better m hypothetical movie that was less faithful to the book. Mm, but this was you... an amazing adaptation, though. Yeah. I would agree based on what I've heard, but I need to read it. Maybe you don't. I've heard it's a slog. It. I heard from you that it's kind of a slog. No, no. I mean, uh. okay. <laughs> if you like <laughs> cerebral science fiction mixed with like political philosophy, and then like really hammy sci-fi, Dune is like meant for you. And it's mm -hmm. to be fair, really unique and a wonderful book. If you're into that type of thing, if you are not into that sort of thing. Um, there are better books out there. Shots fired. Shots fired. Shots fired. <laughs> so I want to tell you what John's version of this movie would be. You ready? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Get the girl. Keep having visions of this girl. Go get the girl. Yeah. Where Let's is she? Down. Where is she? Why is she not Go on page her. 30? <laughs> yeah. Have her on page 30. Go get her. Like, what's he doing to try to get the girl? And then, uh, and then that would be John's movie. And... Yeah. I mean, I mean, we have to ask John what he thought of this movie because I, I would, I would bet money, money. I would bet, I would, bet, I would bet like, I bet you a thousand dollars that wow. John would say, would, that John would say something like, "There was a real tight ninety-minute movie in there." <laughs> Needs an editor. <laughs> oh, I'm really man. confident that that's that would be his note. And I'm confident that he thinks that he should have been going after the girl or that he thinks that that still was the objective and it was just a weak objective. So, yeah, now we're going to have to rate him right after this. Be like, John, what did you think of Dune? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll let everybody know if Adam owes me a thousand dollars. Yeah. Right um, after that. But going back to sort of like, okay, well, what, why not to sort of have a larger situation, not into a single protagonist? Why can't I have my character just sort of be reacting along with the ride? Why do they have to go after something um, tangible and concrete in the context of a movie? Um, the, there are two answers I can think of. One 
it's hard to create stakes when there isn't something being pursued, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and stakes, emotional stakes, tangible external stakes, and you could say philosophical thematic stakes all kind of need to hang on something, right? Like this bad thing will happen if this doesn't happen. Well, what's the if? And if you have it be, if you have like, okay, the thing that needs to, the, the thing that the whole plot hangs on off of, not connected to the thing the protagonist is doing, well, maybe they're the wrong character to follow. It's kind of this phenomenon of like, you, you want the character you're following to be like the pivotal character. Mm -hmm. It's more interesting. Yeah. And then that's also the same reason. So the same reason why you generally need a very like tangible, specific, timely objective stakes is why sometimes horror films can get away with having that be a little bit looser because when you introduce the stakes is okay, this is life and death. Yeah. Okay. Those are some stakes. You're gonna need to make sure you have other things set up to make that as believable and heightened as possible. But that is kind of where that comes in. And that's where I can't even, I was not checking times like I normally do when I watch movies, when you're watching Dune. But at some point it does become that. And I'm kind of curious when. But um, Honestly, the last 20 minutes dragged for me. Yeah, got a little. But I, I, I see little. why they did it. Because if they made a, I'm not going to say what it is, no spoilers, but like if they didn't get to that type of action mm -hmm. um, and they never made a sequel, we wouldn't have been able to see some imagery that was really, and like essential action that's like core to Dune, right? So that's true. You know, yeah. Conditions. So, RV Army says, what about film noir or mysteries? So those like mysteries, you tend to have something that you're trying specifically to figure out. Uncovering right? the mystery is the objective of mm -hmm. the mystery, right? So you always have an objective. And usually in a mystery, the protagonist is the character who A, is actively trying to uh, uncover the mystery, whether like that's why so often it's like an investigator character or somebody who has a real strong personal vested interest in the mystery. Um, you know, like the, the, it can't be somebody who's, it doesn't matter what the history, the mystery has to be important to the people it involves. Um, so the uncovering of the mystery is the objective in a mystery. And that's, I mean, that's also why so often in those mysteries, it's like, it's a detective, but this yeah. case is personal, you know, like that's yeah. always, we've seen, the... <laughs> we've seen the cop movie with the whole thing, you know, and yeah, we've seen it. It's always, but this one. So, <coughs> one last or whatever case it is before I retire <laughs> one last case <laughs> oh um, it's, yeah and that's why they do it though because it has to you make it matter you get stakes right or sometimes it's a reporter sometimes it's uh, it, 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 it just who's the reporter the, who's, who's about to eyes? get fired if they don't get in a really good article it, right, always right? those are the personal you know? stakes family yeah. right like <laughs> you've seen this plot a million times because it works right and you have to think like, okay, I want to tell history. Who are the eyes and ears? Who, who, who's the proxy for the audience? Who's the most interesting character to uncover the mystery with the audience? So you have to ask that question. And maybe you can come up with a really interesting um, answer. If you, if, you, if you choose a character who knows too much, then it's not a mystery. Mm -hmm. um, or it, because the joy of the mystery is the ignorance turning to knowledge. Um, right. Film noir, film noir is. I feel like a lot of them are mysteries, right? It's 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 just a subgenre of of like the detective story, um, with a lot of dames and monologuing, right? <laughs> and voiceover, black and white and rain. Yeah, although there are interesting variations of noir um, out there. Mm -hmm. I think film noir is kind of played out, to be totally honest. And I think that's it's re, it's waiting for a reinvention. I think there it, we're due for like a reinvention of that story. Yeah, like how uh, Star Wars and all those kinds of things are like the new like samurai western. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, that was like a reinvention of that. So yeah. 
somebody have any ideas for how to reinvent film noir? <laughs> or just like, leave it for leave it for the history books, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> it would be cool like, if you could pull it off. That would be a really fun thing. But I think anyway. like something really interesting to think about is sort of like, okay, you look into any genre and mm -hmm. the choice of protagonist and choice of objective is unique to like the promise of that genre. Something I talk about sort of like, okay, mystery, the promise of mystery is to uncover the mystery, um, you know, action adventure. What's the promise of that? What's the promise of that genre? Well, that you're going to be taken on an adventure. Who's the character who following around is going to have the most like, you know, journey. Um, <laughs> and so much of that is tied to objective, right? What if let's, let's talk about the reverse by just not choosing a character who's going after things and going to, I should say, going after something that matters and is concrete, you can't create stakes. And then therefore there's no, there's no, it's, it's not the best person to choose for the adventure. Um, mm -hmm. You could say that for any genre, for any um, film story. And the reason why I keep saying film story is sort of, well, it's one sitting hour and a half to two and a half hours on average is um, the range beginning, middle, and end, complete closure. You watch a film in one sitting. And mm -hmm. if you don't have a, the most interesting character possible, you're not making the most of that time. You're not having the most interesting. When I mean interesting, I just mean, I don't mean the character themselves. I mean, the arc they take, the thing they go after, the reasons why it's important. What happens if they fail? Like that tension, that's, mm -hmm. that's what it's all about. So something that else that I'd like to talk about is before I mentioned how an active pr protagonist requires solid objective, a tangible, timely, important, specific objective. And something that's important to separate from that is motivation. Yeah. And that's something that we do in our tentpole document that we added as like a, when we were really thinking through like, okay, what's the main confusion like what's actually happening here um because sometimes people want to put in an objective that's not tangible that's something like revenge right or like closure or something you know they love they want to put something in there that's a relationship not, yeah a relationship's a big one um yeah. let's talk about the relationship for a second right so if somebody's objective is just a relationship um marriage well, oh, marriage is a little more specific, but a relationship, you know, you could sort of say like, well, you could have an entire second act, which is just a series of episodes of them trying to get relationships. Mm -hmm. And like, there's nothing to hang that on, you know, rather than like a specific, like, oh, I have to get married in 15 days. To That's her. The, you're right. That tends to be when it starts getting specific is it's like, I have to be married in 15 days to this person <laughs> or like, I mean, it's the, I have to have a date for Christmas. Like I'm going yeah. home and I have to be able to have a date for Christmas and it need in like, this is the person who it needs to be. And what that does is it compresses everything and forces you to actually have a plot rather than, so, yeah. So the, so separating out the motivation though can really help with that. So say, yeah. say it's, Say it's love, right? Love or like he wants to not look, he wants to not be embarrassed when he gets home for Christmas. Like things like that. That's the motivation. That's the emotional reason why he wants something. But that's not what he wants. What he wants is this particular person to go with him to the holidays. So to like get this person to walk in the door with him on Christmas Eve for the as a date for the holidays. This is tangible, so specific, timely objective. His motivation might be something more intangible and emotional, but by making it be that specific, you now can start imagining what this movie's gonna be. Like there's all these different possibilities. Like he's gonna have to convince this person to go with him or trick them into going with him. They're going to have to get there. There might be like some sort of a, a road trip involved. The time might be an issue. They're probably running late, if I had to guess. Um, 
they're going to definitely get close on time if there's any kind of timeliness to it. Um, that person's probably going to be interested in someone else. And that only matters if you're going after a specific person. Because otherwise you just go for someone else. Um, so it's it just is helpful to separate the motivation from the objective and keep your objective to something really pinpointed in order to keep your protagonist active. And then the motivation gives them a reason to be active towards it. Like if you're a detective and your objective is to arrest the killer, put the killer behind bars or whatever, like get the killer. That's great. What's their motivation? Vengeance or just something like that. That would keep them active towards the thing. Like you've given them the closure, point. Maybe. Yeah. Closure, right. revenge, something, whatever it is, you know the point that you're trying to get to on the horizon, and then now you have a reason to get there. But you need both of those things. You need the reason and the, the destination. The thing about objective is that it has to be tangible, it has to be mm -hmm. concrete, it has to be achievable, it has to be quantifiable. Um, you know, oh, here's one a classic breaking bad, right? Um his motivation is to provide for his wife and children, his wife and new daughter before he dies. That's a huge emotional motivation. But his objective, I, I believe in season one, is like $500,000 from meth. Very specific. And then yeah. in the season two, it becomes it like the, the goalposts change, but it's always something. There's always something he's going after, even if it's, you know, oh my God. I knew I, I, you know, my business is, I have to, I have to secure my interests. I have to gain this amount of territory. I have to keep the cartel out. Right? Um, in TV, the, you can have multiple objectives depending on the season. And I think Breaking Bad doesn't have like one major thing he's working towards every season. But mm -hmm. um, that motivation, that emotional motivation, you know, it's pretty consistent throughout the story. And the emotional motivation is going to be like, if your protagonist was charging towards the objective and had to like stop and have a diner scene and talk to somebody about how they're feeling, the motivation would be the thing that they're talking about, right? Like yeah. that would be the thing that is on their mind. That's why they're doing this. That's why they're invested. And it's related. Like it's directly related to the objective, but it's not quite the same thing. Um, it's not just that he's like really, really passionate about locking this one person up for no reason. Yeah. They'd probably talk about like whoever the person hurt or whatever it is. Um, so that gives them the fuel to be active and then something to be active towards. Um, just to answer Dilla's uh, comment. Um, yeah. React a passive reactive is kind of synonymous, you know, like passive characters tend to be reactive. <laughs> um, but it's more just like directionlessly reactive, right? Because you could have a, a character reacting to something with stakes and that's a little different, right? Like they're reacting to preserve, to preserve the thing they want. It's different mm -hmm. than like a character being steered by somebody else. That's why I think they use the word passive, sort of like they're not in control of their destiny. Mm -hmm. they're just sort of being pushed from point A to point B by external forces. So active and passive protagonist is the term that, uh, that like, is used more broadly. But I do think that, so Dilla, what you're describing here reminds me of my example about the rain. A passive protagonist would be someone just standing in the rain, allowing themselves to just get poured on and doing nothing about it. A reactive one might have an umbrella and that's it, right? Because they're reacting to the rain, but they're still not doing anything. And then an active protagonist would be both reacting, so like with an umbrella, and going towards something. Um, and I think that that's... People, writers tend to get confused about if reactive is a subcategory of passive or a subcategory of active. And, and it's, it's all definitely semantics. passive. But you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, but it's definitely passive. Because like it's just it's not enough just to react, and so that falls into the category of passive. So that's I bring it up because I know that this is something that comes up a lot with John, where he's like, "Your protagonist is, is passive. 
people are like, how are they passive? They're doing lots of things. It's like, okay, well, the things they're doing are only reactive. And that is a version of passive. And so that yep. that's the reason why I'm getting into it is because most people don't make the mistake of accidentally making their protagonist do literally nothing. Most people make the mistake of having their protagonist only react. Like that's a much more common. And this is one of, of the, if, if you had to make a list of, uh, you know, and like public enemy number one for bad second acts, this is it, right? Mm -hmm. Like people say, oh, my act two fell apart. It's so hard. It's because you set up a character and then they just sort of react and the story runs out of steam. Um, the trick to feature screen writing is nailing act two and act three, right? <laughs> Act two, act one's the easy part. Anyone can write the first 30 pages of a screenplay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, maybe not anybody, but like a lot of people can do that. Not a lot of people can stick the landing and tell a story that feels emotionally satisfying. Um, so a way of an oversimplification, but something that's still true is that act two is all objective you get your objective at the inciting incident the break and like slash the break into act two and you either get it or you don't at the ultimate you come face to face with it anyway yeah at the ultimate test at the break into act three so objective only really fully exists in act two and without objective you can't be you typically can't be active. So that Although means to be, that- an, to, to add well, point, you can introduce yeah. an objective earlier, but the protagonist commits to objective yeah. in act two. Yeah. So by that, act one, you have a little bit more leeway for character who is technically passive, at least in regards to the objective. So that'll be like the time where you have them kind of just like you show us their normal world, you show us the things they care about, um, and you basically set up for this inciting incident subjective. Like you give us a, a believable reason why they would be motivated to go after this objective when we break into act two. Um, but so that's that was what we were talking about when we were saying this Dune, Dune part one feels like Dune act one where he's just setting up why he cares and building up towards an inciting incident that's going to give him something specific to do. And when and the second one it. comes out, th from that point on, I, I don't think there's a single person who will ever watch part one by itself. They'll watch part one and then watch part two, like a TV show. You know, like that, that, that Dune, Dune parties will be watching both of them as like a five hour movie. Because the yeah. second one is good. The second one's like where all the stuff happens, isn't it? Second one, I mean, this it's it's the it's where all of the it's all of Act Two and Act Three. Mm. So it's like Paul going after what he's going after, and interesting developments, twists, stakes, the Emperor, lots of interesting political stuff. You know, the promise of the story. You know. Yeah. A lot of weird shit. <laughs> <laughs> It's already been kind of weird. It's been fun. I liked it. I liked it a lot. Like, I really liked the world. The casting was pretty freaking phenomenal. Casting really helped a lot, I think. Because I think and, a lot of the characters were very wooden in the book. And mm. the casting was so fantastic that, like, it doesn't... It, it works. I think some characterization works better in the movie, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I mean, our good friend Tim... Is just really, you know, good she, she's at perfect casting for that role. Yeah, yeah, and like it, like making scenes where there's not dialogue happening, interesting. Um, <laughs> I saw this meme of like, this isn't a spoiler, but at some point he has to keep his hand in a box, and the box is painful, and like you see him like reacting to this pain, and there was like some meme where they replaced it with that little UV light box that you have to get your nails done in. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And I, I appreciated that a lot. Um, 
If you haven't seen it, I'd recommend it. Apparently, it's supposed to be on HBO Max soon, if not now. Yeah, watch it in theaters, though. Like, it was, if you it's can. like one of those rare movies that if you can and it's an option, do it. Like, it's Adam made us see it in IMAX. So, I mean, it was good, though, right? Like, it was good. It was a good choice. It was a good yeah. choice, but that was I don't want to watch just any movie in IMAX, too. Like, I, I don't need to watch like a kitchen table movie in an IMAX, you know, like, I want to watch a spectacle, and this was a spectacle. I also think I would have liked it a lot less on HBO Max. Really? Because I would have been focused more on, I think, the parts that were like slower. Like the mm. spectacle and sound was so well rendered and so ambitious and the directing was so vivid. Like it, you, it really helps the story. Um, like little yeah. details like the, um, the, the voice the way it worked and like it feels like a like the i mean in the benny jesuit like all the reverend mothers have the shared memories of every other reverend mother who's ever lived and the voice actually sounds like all of the reverend mothers speaking in your head mm -hmm. like little details like that like it's not just one ver and it's like not paul's voice it's like all these old women's voices it's like that's really good that's like the yeah. type of detail that like I wouldn't have been able to feel if I wasn't in a theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, that's true. And you could feel it. It was very loud and rumbly, which was very loud and fun. rumbly. <laughs> <laughs> so go um, check it out if you can. That was that was the first time I've been in a theater since COVID. So I don't cut cutting blurry. out. Um, okay, let's talk about. Um, let's let's go back to screenwriting stuff. Um, you know, I think that there's like a lot of resistance to the idea of like, well, what do I mean? I have to do one objective, one protagonist, yeah. one objective. Doesn't isn't that formulaic? Isn't that boring? Um, we're just talking about the platonic ideal of the average movie, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is like a thing. It's a phenomena that happens. It's really, really, really effective. And if you find another way to achieve the same effect, which is audience um, investment, go for it, right? Um, yep. But this is just the vast majority of movies work this way. Um, and for a reason, right? Like it's limited time, limited characters. I do truly believe though, that plot is defined by objective. Like yeah. if you don't have a clear objective, you don't have a plot. I would agree. Even if that's five objective lines that are interlacing, it's still you have characters who are going after things. Um, that used to always confuse me so much when I was a kid because we would have to like analyze stories in English class and they'd be like, what's the theme? Like, what's the plot? And I'm right. like, I don't know. I don't know the difference here, but it really is. It just comes down to the plot is what do they physically need? And then the theme is connected to the change they're going to undergo along the way to what they emotionally need. It used to, oh, uh, I used to hate that. I could never figure out the difference, which in retrospect, it's obvious. But at the time, I was just like, I don't know. I don't know which one's plot and which one's theme. Like, because it's all just like to become friends with someone or like, I don't know, friendship. It was just always confusing to me. Yeah, and sometimes it is. Yeah, deceptively brutal. Because it forces you, forces you to take all the theory and dreams about your story, and get concrete and be like, okay, what is what are the things? What what is this? Is this a sports movie? Is this a mystery? What is this? Yeah, it takes like people don't like it too because it feels like. You have like this dirty. wonderful thing in your head that's like super emotional and super like artsy, and you don't want to have like <laughs> things boxing you in in order to tell your story. It's like, okay, well, you're writing a film. So there's a way somebody's going to enjoy this. They're going to enjoy it sitting down, watching a screen. They're going to expect it to take, but Adam said, 90 minutes to like two and a half hours at the longest. There's all these other things that your art is already going into. This is the way that stories 
have worked like this before and you can use it. Um, you can use it to help you. Um, but people, yeah, people get really up in arms about that at first because it feels like it's making, they feel like they're being forced to put a formula on it, but it's not a formula and we don't call it a formula. It's you can be formulaic just, about it though. Like you can, you can. totally, and, and I think a formulaic approach will give you formulaic results, right? Like it's more just sort of asking yourself great questions and using it as a framework to, to build out from, right? Like you can have those amazing high level emotional, thematic connective scenes and ideas. But like, if the movie's about the guy getting on the boat, like, it's okay to write that down. You can have a lot of story about a guy trying to get on a boat before Wednesday, you know, <laughs> like, uh, like, yeah. like there's so much you can do and making a choice like that, just distilling a plot down to like a sentence, um, with good stakes. If you can achieve that, if you can achieve the simplicity of that, um, it's a powerful thing. It's kind of like the equivalent of, uh, not to mix metaphors or anything, but like, yeah, for people in like songwriting and music, it's like the equivalent of like writing with choruses, right? It's the catchy part that people recognize. Human brains latch on to a chorus. Um, human brains latch on to like clean objectives with stakes. Mm -hmm. It's it's just kind of a similar thing. It's like a concrete. It's just it's the it's the it's the the blood and salt. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, Kim brought this up. How about the grand passion establishing the objective? Yes. Yeah. That's so that is tip that is like related to I would say grand passion is a type of motivation. Would you say that's true? Yeah, 100%. And um the grand passion, the, I got the term from uh from Pixar uh, or Michael Arndt's videos on Toy Story 3 which really good, really good video I recommend watching that. But um Basically, um, you know, Pixar movies almost not, I think there are some new ones that don't do this, but almost all of them introduce a protagonist, the thing they love more than anything in the world. And the inciting incident is, takes away that grand passion. And the objective is getting it back or the specific concrete way of getting it back. For Nemo, he loves being a father more than anything but he has a toxic relationship with being a father. So, you know, it's not all, not all great. So the flaw is tied to the toxic relationship with the grand passion, but like finding Nemo, it's Marlon. He loves being a father more than anything, but he's micromanaging. His son, you know, is rejecting his micromanagement and gets lost and captured by humans. Nemo's object, or sorry, Marlon's objective is to get Nemo back. Mr. Incredible. It's finding Nemo. Hey, finding Eva, there you go. Literally, yeah. it's the objective, right? But um, <laughs> Mr. Incredible loves being a superhero more than anything, but he's a little egocentric about it um, to the point where, you know, this event happens where superheroes are banned altogether and he has to get a normal job. His objective is to, you know, be a superhero again, um, get, back in the, get back in the game. Um, and, and like you could do a list of all the Toy Story movies. Like Woody loves being Andy's favorite toy more than anything, but he's a little toxic about it. He has to be the favorite. Joy um, Inside Out wants Riley yeah. to only feel joy all the time, and that's what leads to her problems. But um, it's it's this not all. This is just Pixar. It's the trick mm -hmm. they use to get people emotionally invested in a single year singular character point of view. But all of their objectives are extremely tangible. And it's never a motivation for an objective. The motive, mm -hmm. but they do have strong thematic motivations, right? Like, you know, Marlon, like, what does it mean to be a father? You know, especially when you're afraid for, like, what does it mean to be afraid for your son when you don't believe that he can be without you? You know, that, that is a really huge question, you know, and they really explore that um, with Nemo's little disability, you know, and like his fear of the ocean. What place is scarier than the ocean? Um, there's a lot of depth there, but at the end of the day, it's get his son back. Yeah. That's I'd be too. interested to try to make a list of other types of motivations that commonly come up because I would, so if we're saying that grand passion is a type of motivation. 
I'm sure that there's others that kind of fit under that too. And it's a really fun one. And it's one you can use outside the Pixar films and it won't like automatically make it seem like a younger movie or like a family film. It's just yeah. one way to approach story and it would work for everything. I would like uh, Michael Arndt. You could do a noir worked. with the same approach. Yeah, you could. He loves he playing wants to be the very more best, than anything. Like no one ever was. I mean, what is Ash Ketchum if not a grand passion? God. Um, actually, what? Oh, anime, anime <laughs> shonen, I should say shonen anime protagonists in particular all have extremely unachievable, strong, like, like objectives. Like Ash wants to be a Pokemon master. So he has Very to get best. all the badges. But he, the, being a Pokemon ma master is his motivation. Getting the badges to compete in the league is his objective. Mm -hmm. So what's it's the coming. whole story of Pokemon about? The anime, yep. or at least original one. He goes from gym to gym to get the badges. Yep. That's it. And then he has to go fight the Elite Four, beat the champion, become the champion. So his motivation is to be the very best like no one ever was. And maybe something personal in his childhood that they never explore or something. But then his tangible objective is I have to beat the champion. And that involves all of these different steps leading up to it. But I didn't play the games or anything. Oh, nope. thank you, Andilla. And yeah, you have literally 18 Pokemon things right behind you. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. I didn't even. Carl did this for me though, so I, I can't. Yeah, claim yeah, yeah. It. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. He did. Uh, I've not bought anything on here. No, I bought the coconut turtle, and I bought that candle. There's but... a lasting appeal to Pokemon. Um, the new ones are anyway. coming out. Everyone, get hey. them with me. And uh, man, just if your kids, great taste. Great. But just going. Taste. But just going back to um, <coughs> objective having an active protagonist. Like what would Pokemon look like if Ash um, wasn't going after badges? Right? Like, like, like mm -hmm. how would you have a plot? The entire plot is designed around that. Like um, anime have, has, uh, shown in anime has extremely strong objectives. Um, even if it's Dragon Ball and he's like, you know, I've got to beat up the thing <laughs> before we all die. I wish Ash would do this. Ash, catch him. It's put the hit out on other gym badge owners to get that goal faster. He would make him the very best that no one, like no one ever was if he took out the competition. Yeah, Ash uh, sucks at fighting with Pokemon so because he loses every single tournament, right? So he probably could use some dirty tricks. Oh, Andilla, I didn't even notice your typo until just now. Now but we're you judging spelled but you spell embarrassment right and Chiron, Chiron. So I'll put this on the screen so that now everyone knows that you can spell embarrassment, which is really, I can never get that right. Too many A's and R's and S's right there in a row. Can't do it. Um, th this, is, this is the type of thing like, I really recommend people like get good at, I'm trying to get my screen to focus. I have to be focused. There we go. Uh, I I really I just want people to <laughs> embrace objective, embrace characters who like really thirst for things and go after it. Like it's just so much more interesting to look at. Mm -hmm. Lots to talk about Pokemon. Okay. Yeah. Everyone should be playing Arceus with me. Come. Um, I'm gonna skip January, it, February. I just, I just, I just, I'm just over it. Not for me anymore. Were you ever into it? Yeah. How I many did you play? I uh, was really into. I played Blue back in like 1998. Okay, that's I, one. I uh, played Sapphire. I was really into Sapphire. Mm -hmm. And um, you skipped and then the I got gems, the new sword. All right. Mm. Yeah. I yeah I did because um, okay. you know. I mean, thirty percent is an. I was a casual. A I was a casual. 30% in a passing grade, but we'll, 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 we'll say, okay. <laughs> I was not a Digimon kid. I'm, I, I Were you a Yu-Gi-Oh kid? 
I love Yu-Gi-Oh. That was my show. I knew it. I knew it. I I I still watch the Saturday morning cartoons. I was into that. Um, Uh Yu-Gi-Oh is actually, the the manga is really fucked up because it wasn't about card games at first. The first, it was about, it was basically just like this ancient Egyptian spirit who's obsessed with deadly games uh, possesses this kid and then actually kills people who lose. Yeah. Why don't they do that version? Let's do a Yu-Gi-Oh adaptation. No, because then one of the later ar- arcs was about the card game, and then the card game became huge, and then it's all about the card game. Was it the heart of cards that inspired you, Adam? <laughs> Listen, it's not great storytelling, but um, I enjoyed it when I was uh, young. Ooh. Yeah, and then they did a manga adaptation after the anime. I'm, I'm talking about the original run, um, where he'd like play like weird little little made up games, but like with life and death stakes, be like, if you lose this game of Yahtzee, I'm going to break your mind forever. I was like, Jesus Christ, dude. <laughs> All right, here we go. A real question. Thank Richard you. Please. says, can it be possible for a protagonist to aim for an objective? Uh, and while maybe a secondary char- char- character is carrying the motivation, I would say, hang on, let's go and read the second part of this though but carries the motivation of what the story as a whole is trying to accomplish through its three theme by splitting us up with two characters. So I have an answer for this. A secondary character can carry their own motivation, but overall, no. So motivation a lot of times is an answer to, I'm going to get into theory stuff real quick. So let's go into theory. Let's do it. Let's do it. So in a film, you have a thematic question that's something like, what does family mean? Something broad that's the theme of your movie. And every single character in this film has an answer to that thematic question. And a lot of times, the protagonist's current answer is tied to their motivation. So if it's like, I don't know. I'm trying to think of... uh, I'm blanking on examples. Help me, Adam. What was an example of motivation? So Finding Nemo, what would you say the thematic question is? Like, what? Like, Can we what, choose what to let our family uh, go. grow up, right? Yeah. And so then every other, every single character in that has a different answer to that question. Nemo says, like, let me do my thing. I'm chill. Nemo's dad, Marlon, Merlin, is like, no, I need to protect you at all times. Um, so everybody has their own answer to this question. And Merlin's answer to that, as in, no, I need to protect you at all times, doubles as his motivation. So that's why he's going after his objective. And so Dory is helping him, right? And she might have her own motivation for this. I wish I could remember more about Dory, but if anybody remembers why she's doing it i don't think she remembers why she's doing it (laughs) but it would be like it'd be like that like everybody has their own answer to the thematic question and typically the protagonist's answer to the thematic question is related to their motivation if not the same exact thing um like toy story um what would you say the thematic question of toy story was I mean, there's a real question about, you know, from Woody's point of view, I would say it's, it's, uh, has to do with breaking your perceptions of yourself, like what you really, who you, who you really are to other people, you know, like, because there's a dual thing with Woody Woody and Buzz, like Andy, his, uh, sorry, Woody and relate Woody's relationship with Andy, the fact is like, I have to be Andy's favorite toy. You know, that's so connected to who, how Woody sees himself. Like, yeah, it's like, how is, do you derive self-worth? And Right. We're, right. Yeah. And we're so like, Buzz. So, so Woody, Woody sees himself, I am Andy's favorite toy. What am I without that? You know? Mm-hmm. And Buzz says, I am a space stranger. That's all I am. Like, get out of here. I'm not a toy. And Woody's self-image is broken when he realizes and really accepts that he's no longer the favorite. 
and Buzz's self image is broken when you realize, oh, fuck, I'm not a space ranger. I am a toy. What meaning yeah. could I possibly have? And they both find new meaning. Woody, when he's, uh, Andy, uh, sorry, uh, Buzz, when he says to him, it's like, you know, there's a boy waiting for us who we have to, we have to be there for. And Woody sort of, sort of saying like, I'm going to accept you. We can both be Andy's favorites together. I'm okay. You know, like, so, so it's really sort of about self-image. I'm, I'm doing this on the spot. Like, I think you could really distill that into one powerful sentence about like how we see ourselves. So here we go. Okay. So now I'm going to revise what I was saying about finding Nemo with this idea of like looking at what every single character wants, not just Merlin. And it look, it seems to me like this film I haven't seen in forever, <laughs> finding Nemo, that the thematic question is related to like what it's related to our relationship with family and home. Right. And Merlin says, something along the lines of like i have to protect it or it'll be gone like i must be the one protecting it i can't trust the people that i love to go be safe somewhere else nemo says like i can go be like i can do whatever i want like i don't need you blah, blah, blah. dory is saying that she is something in there about wanting to remember her family so it's all these like different like ways of viewing your relationship to your family or to where you come from and things like that. So I'd say that that's the theme. And then all of them have their own motivations for getting involved that are connected to that theme. Dory wants, has her own relationship with home and her memories and things like that. So does Merlin. Um, but I'm, I think Dory's just, I'm just out of focus. <laughs> you're just going to be, uh, you're just going to be blurry forever. I thought it was me at first. <laughs> but, uh, My addition. That's right. <laughs> Um, but I hope that that's starting to make sense. That's like everybody but, has their own motivation, has their own answer to the thematic question. And a lot of times that's what's motivating them to do things. So, um, but the also, protagonist always has their own too. So, and and the, the reason why we're going on these soliloquies to explain for examples is like, this is not, this is like showing your work sort of stuff, right? Like it's not about the one question. It's about the consistency and thematic unity between all the characters, everybody having a clear cut emotion that's part of the same story, right? Like it's, what matters is the answers the characters have. It's not, the, que the question matters less than the answers, um, if that makes sense. So like to reverse engineer a subconscious like unity, um, you, can, you can come up with a lot of material. What matters is what's your story about really? And how's it of a piece? How's it connected to the subjective stakes crap anyway, you know? Um, <laughs> hey. Adam, I have lost my sound. Today's just You've a lost technical sound? Can you hear me? Well, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, well, I can't yes. hear you. The so thumbs up is a yes. ramble from now until the end of time. And uh, and there's nothing you can do about it because I can't hear you. Um, well, this is on yes. you because I can hear Dang, you. I thought it was a no. Um, I'm going to try to get this figured out. But here, in the meantime, oh, this is a great point, Michelle, unless Adam already said that. But I wouldn't know. Uh, maybe the question is, what is family and what must we do to keep them? I say yes. I think you're getting much, much closer to the thematic question than I was. Maybe we all need to rewatch it and then come and talk about it together. Um, and then here is another thing. And then Adam, I'm going to let you take it while I try to fix my sound. But Great. Richard says, does one character's motivation have to be the right answer or in the story though? Um, so that is the role of your mentor. Typically is that the mentor holds the right answer to the question and it's the answer that the protagonist is going to learn to accept over the course of the movie um but that they don't start with it so their motivation is usually something it's oftentimes something that will shift or change as they get going and that's how come like sports movies where you don't win the game but you 
make a bunch of friends along the way, you know, work. But okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Adam talk because I have to fix my sound. Yeah, no worries. Um, <clears throat> so, but, but it's less about like the right answer. It's more of the emotional journey of the, the emotional answer that the character protagonist reaches at the end. The mentor helps them have their arc. It's not so much about um, the objective right answers that the, that the writer is thinking. It's, you can have everybody in your kit story be fucking wrong, like from your point of view, right? It's more just sort of like within the context of the story, um, what they're learning, what their character arc is. Um, there are just some other good questions here. Um, for a short film I'm writing, my character is in day 12 of quarantine. Here's a knock on the door. He gets a conflict with himself whether to open the door or not. Does it work? Um, maybe. Um, I. It depends on. I mean, that's not a lot of information on terms of like. It's 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 a question, right? Will the character open the door or not? Um, I don't know if that's a strong objective. Mm -mm. Like in terms of like, objectively. <laughs> objectively objective, but it could work for a short film. I, I think it really depends on like, why wouldn't they? How interesting are you gonna go? Like, if it's really just a boring, if it's a boring answer that doesn't have emotional context, then you're not going to grab people. But if it's a question of sort of being like, what are the stakes? What do they sacrifice to open the door? That's when you'll start to get to interesting places. Um, so like a version of this that does work that I would be shocked if this was the movie you were going to do. But, like, let's just play with this. Yeah, go for Person it. orders a pizza. Their objection, objective, their objective is I want the pizza, right? But there's this quarantine going on. And so when this person shows up, they have to try to, and they have like this crippling fear of opening their door and like getting exposed to this, but they decided that they want to order this pizza anyway. Then now you've already given us a stronger reason why they're playing with opening the door or not opening the door. And you tell us which one their objective is. Their objective requires them to open the door, right? Um, so just something like that, like where you give them something on the other side of the door that they want in order to motivate why this is really an issue because i i know that there's been a lot of times when like people can knock on your door and you can just like let it you don't have to get it like what what's it matter what are the stakes if it's your pizza and you've decided that you really really need this pizza for whatever reason this is like super important to you in a short film then now there's a reason to open the door and there's a reason not to because you're in quarantine so that's when you start getting conflict and things like that going. But if it's just a knock, why do they care? You know, why do they want to open it? Let's see. Did you have something else to say, Adam? Yeah, I'm just sort of uh, commenting on the Richard and Michelle's uh, interaction there is like, yeah, 100% writers um, are not omniscient. And, you know, the audience is going to disagree with some, the, there's always going to be somebody who disagrees with your morally correct, what you think is morally correct, right? Like, and the context of the film, this is kind of maybe goes not to get too political, but like, um, I, this is why I don't think movies can be apolitical, right? Because they're made by human beings who ex exist in a society in their uh, context and social environment will seep into and affect every single choice in the creation of the movie um mm -hmm. you know and somebody is not going to like what you have to say and that's okay you know um you you you, <laughs> you certainly uh i mean i'd be amazed if an individual has a you know a character totally rendered with complete like objective truth where they like realize something um and then that everyone can agree with that's just not the case um maybe I mean, I'm like i didn't no i mean like i i mean mitchell's versus the machines was a movie that a lot of people greenlit 
and that got made and got on Netflix. People love that movie. I don't. I don't care for the overall like arc that happens there. I don't care for it at all. I don't care for like the stance it takes on the thematic question. So I'm one of those people that's just not going to be pleased with that movie despite it being a really solid movie and that's okay. If the dad doesn't so. die, you don't want a father or daughter story. No. No. Yeah. yeah, it was the dad. It was the fact that the responsibility for like that the dad was kind on of a her dick. to reach out to him. Yeah, and that they put the responsibility on the daughter and that she was the one who had to overcome it when she's a child. And that is the parent's job to it's grow he's up. An adult, it was his job to, ch to, to understand and change for her. Totally agree. Or just understand. Yeah, he probably should have changed. But yeah, he just I've he never broke seen... her computer and his little fit. Like, get oh, over God. yourself. Yeah, that was, that was bullshit. I hated but that. Moving on. Um... <laughs> Um, I have never seen a Fast and Furious movie, so I'm missing out. Haven't seen I any. I have, of them. but I can't remember. Almost never as seen one. As the Casablanca. I'm surprised you're shocked by the Casablanca omission. You know, it's just Adam really doesn't want to watch it because got to respect his uh, got to respect his opinions on that. That's one. you, man. I mean, Casablanca is fine. I, 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 <laughs> I, uh, I think there's so many better movies from that era. Like, yeah. it's so funny to me that like people have built it up to be like this, like, oh, wow, it's one of the finest movies of its generation. Yeah, it's better than a lot of stuff, but, like, there are better movies from the 50s. And, you know, like, it, that, it's fact. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, that's just my opinion. <laughs> this is, like, my opinion. Yeah. Um, that's all Lexi and I have. Yes. <laughs> and now we've alienated Andilla, and uh, it's time to and end the us. class. <laughs> I'm fine with that. So, yeah, we did Spider Verse, um, or I did for writing the feature. Oh, we need to. We should do it for real because I. I so when we spent our, I'm sick of it. I've seen it. Times in a cave, right? Doing writing the feature, we were with Spider Verse so much. It feels it's one like of our example films. Yeah. Um, but isn't there a new one coming out? We'll do that. Oh, I'll watch the new one for sure. Yeah. Um, who knows if it's going to be good, you know? Never know. I feel like there was something else that there was another movie. If there's anything that's coming out now that you all really want to like have a conversation about, or for that matter, if there's a topic you'd like us to cover here, um, we had some good suggestions like notes, like how to give and receive notes and things like that. Um, we're always looking for more topics. So please let us know you can like you could really just say so right now and i'll remember or you could let us know in the discord because we want to talk about what you want to talk about awesome uh, so yeah thank you so much for coming everybody um let's do the one takeaway thing what's your one takeaway adam about writing active protagonists your one tip master objective and thinking about objective you know mm -hmm. Like I really embrace it. Like, like I get good at identifying objective in when you're watching a story, even if it's a 30 second story, there's always mm -hmm. an objective. It's, it's just oh. part of the design of plot. And if you really understand that, um, oh yeah, I'd love to do a Ghibli movie. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm such I'm a say, for those. That's also why we haven't done any of those is because, uh, because Adam doesn't I'm want to. Artist. Yeah. Adam says, don't do it. I, so I uh, can't do Casablanca, can't do Ghibli, you know. I, I, pr I would prefer to do a Ghibli film, personally. I think they're I much better. Than, yeah, they're great. Um, what's a good one? What's a good one? Um, what's a really good one? That, Nausicaa is actually amazing. It's an amazing movie, and you would I really like it. I bet it's, I would. Um, it's, like, it's like a Lord of the Rings-style epic. And actually, it's influenced a lot by Dune. Huh. It's sci-fi epic. It's really, it's kind of like Princess Mononoke. It's very good. Active antagonist could be good. Good That's antagonist. Good. I think antagonists oh are always active, right? Because Same you, have show. To have, hmm? you have to have bad guys like doing things. They have to be. They have to be the protagonist of their own story. And to be a protagonist, yeah. you have to be active. So, I mean, there probably is a lot we can talk about. 
Kiki was my freaking jam. I don't even Kiki's remember why amazing. I liked Kiki so much, but that was like it's a great movie, Alexi. I was it not a kid up. who watched I wasn't a kid who watched the same thing over and over and over again, but I probably saw that one more than other things. So yeah, Princess Mononoke is really good too, but we've already talked about it a few times. Um Yeah. We talked it was like a three for one. Yeah. Maybe we'll do maybe now is like a Valley of the Wind is a really good movie. Um it's a little long, but it's really good. The it's it's 20 place. minutes too long. It's 20 minutes too long. Mm. I tried but Howl's like, Moving Castle and hated it. Not going to lie. Like, what did you I watch? I couldn't. Like? Recently. Really? At my old apartment. Yeah, I just, I couldn't. Like, I had to do it in, like, three different sessions because I just couldn't. Yeah, it's, it's a love or hate movie. And I think so much of it is that the novel, like, so, so it's an adaptation of this, uh, of this uh, British fantasy novel um, by this, uh, I forget her name. What's the name of the author? But she's very accomplished and uh, Heo Miyazaki is a big fan of hers. Um, but the thing is about the movie is that he invents plot lines that aren't in the book, but he also tries to fit in all the plot lines from the book. And then there's like a lot of like weird things, like the scarecrow guy being the prince. Like, like that was a huge Where's thing in the book. From? It was a huge thing in the book, but he's like, oh yeah, yeah, and that happened. Yeah. But like, I'm going to make this whole anti-war stance where he goes through the doorway, and that wasn't in the book at all. So like, there's like a lot of confusion with like what he was adding to the adaptation and like the plot of the book. And I don't think it was totally successful, but like the imagery was amazing. I mean, it you know what amazing. I think we should do? I think we should do a coffee class that's called like a special brand of coffee class that's called like, Adam Talks about Ghibli films. And then you just come on here and you just get your full time to just <laughs> go for it. We could also have Adam talk some no, other no, no. things. And then I'll talk Winter's Bone. We'll just get that out of our system. I'm sick of, well, I'm sick of talking about Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. Gotta we move moved on, on to point. Miyazaki. Move on. We'll talk about it when the horrible Amazon adaptation, or not adaptation, uh, original series comes out. What we, uh, I saw Wheel of whatever is coming out. Oh, soon. no, Amazon is doing a Lord of the Rings show. Oh, and it's Isn't not we'll... based on any of the books. It's just brand new story in the world. Oof. And it's going to be terrible. What should be amazing? Okay, it just can't be good. I hope it's amazing and that you and have to eat your words. It's the most expensive TV production ever at a billion dollars. And the two guys who are show running it are virtual unknowns. Why didn't they choose us? I don't know. Well, I would say no to that job. I mean, I would say yes, but like, I don't want that job. Like, I would rather have <laughs> you would something. You not have said no. I'd, I'd rather have something that a I wasn't set up for failure. Right? There's nothing they yeah. could do that would be true to Tolkien, right? Because it's such mm -hmm. like it's just the type of thing you just can't make shit up. In. You know, it's not like Star Wars where, you know, it's all kind of loose and doesn't matter anyway. You know, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like um, I don't know. Hot take. It was mistaken for the Hobbit. It was a mistake for the Hobbit to be taken out of Hobbiton. <laughs> I, you know my, sorry, my my beef with the Hobbit is the story should have been about Bilbo and the dwarves, right? And it sort of became not really about the dwarves in the end. Like they, the dwarves were all kind of just sort of secondary. And I really think there was a more interesting story that wasn't trying to be um, Lord of the Rings two. You know, like that was focused more on like unique aspects of dwarven culture um, and stuff that we haven't seen before. Um, because the best parts of those movies were that and the worst parts were everything that was pretending to be Lord of the Rings, but just it was weirdly out of place. Fair enough. Yeah. Sounds like you all have a collaboration to do, Michelle and Dilla. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. If there's... Yeah. So we will see you next week. And again, please let us know if there's something that you want us to talk about in the future. So far, we've seen some Studio Ghibli stuff, antagonists. Um, just let us know. And we would be down to. We're picking everything we're going to do for November in the next couple of days. So let us know. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Thanks.